This video is going to be about the multiplication rule. It's going to be the first of a quick series of videos that try to help us learn various counting principles. That is, we're trying to count the sizes of sets, and this is going to turn out to be a very important rule for us. We'll start out with a quick definition. Hopefully the definition is not too bad. We'll draw a little picture that might help us see what the definition is saying. Then we'll try to generalize it. And then we'll just jump into three examples, and that'll be it. Okay, so we'll start with our definition. If operation, for whatever operation A is, can be performed in M ways and operation B can be performed in N ways, then the sequence operation A followed by operation B can be performed in M times N ways. So if you have two operations, A and B, and A, for whatever the operation may be, can happen in M different ways, and operation B can happen in N different ways, then the sequence where you do operation A first and then operation B can happen in M times N ways. So let's see that in a quick picture. So if A starts out and there is let's say M equal to three ways A can happen, and then B follows, and there are just two ways that B can happen, then you get all of these different combinations. That's just two for each one of A. Two, operate, two uh, ways B can happen for each way A can happen. Two ways B can happen for each way A can happen. Two ways B can happen for each way A can happen. So hopefully you see this works out for any M and N through a simple kind of tree like this. We can generalize the definition. If we have operations n i for i in 1 to capital I and each n each operation can happen in ni ways, then the sequence of n1 through ni can happen in n1 times n2 times all the way up to n i ways. And we might want to write that in simpler notation like that, which in LaTeX you can get out as prod underscore i equal to 1. Oh, whoops. Should 
be a capital N. Two capital I space N underscore I. And this is a caret shift six. Okay, so I have typed out three examples for us. Let's get them going in order. So here is example number one. To open a bank's vault, one must turn one of two dials, the left dial first in a certain direction for two revolutions, and then stop at a specific position. Then the right dial must be turned to the right for two revolutions and then stopped at a specific position. How many different settings are there? So what we're trying to do then is break down the steps into these operations. So we can start with, let's define N1 to be turn left dial in one of two directions. That is, you could either turn it to the left or right. So N1 is just equal to two. There's either turn the left dial to the left or turn the left dial to the right. Okay. And then stop at a specific position. Well, that really depends on what kind of dials you have. So if you've got a dial that could be stopped See, I tried to draw um, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Perfect. If you have two dials that can be stopped in any of 12 positions, then you might have N2 equal to 12 for however many positions on the left dial. Okay, then the right dial must be turned to the right. Okay, so there's no real N3 that counts for direction because the right dial must be turned to the right. So there's really only one choice to be made there. So you could create an N3, but it would just be equal to one. And then say you have, um, the right dial, which looks identical to the left dial, and it has 12 different positions. So then you maybe have a different N3, which is 12. However, many positions on the right dial. Okay, so then the question is, how many different settings are possible? In this case, it would be N1 times N2 times N3. And that is 2 times 12 times oops, 12. So that's um, 288. And you all can make fun of me later if I didn't do my math right. That's 144 times 2, 288. I think that's okay. So there are 288 different settings to open a bank's vault. Theoretically, you could check each combination in a matter of seconds. So this turns out to be not a very secure bank vault. So there you have it. But you could imagine what you would need to do to get more um, security at a bank vault. I'll leave it to you to figure out if it would be better to add more positions on each dial or if it would be better to add more dials. That is an excellent question that you should think through. Which is it better to do? Add more positions for each dial or add more dials? I'll leave that one to you and we'll move on to example number two. Okay, in 1824, oh, here is example in 1824, the Braille alphabet was invented. There are, in the Braille alphabet, uh, six dots with two columns uh, with three dots each. So we might see something like 
this as representing a general symbol in the Braille alphabet. Each dot can be raised or not. So I'm going to fill in some dots to mark that they're maybe raised off of the surface on which these are put. So I can't really draw raised, so I'm just going to do it like this. So there is an example of a symbol written in the Braille alphabet. This turns out to be the letter M. How many different symbols can be written in Braille? So what I would encourage you to do is think about this like this. There are essentially six different operations here, and each one has two ways it could be carried out. You could either have a raised point or a not raised point. So you'd essentially have two times two times two times two times two times two. Did I get that right? Equals two to the sixth. And that happens to be equal to 64. So theoretically, you could write out 64 different symbols in the Braille alphabet. Since the English language only has 26 letters, there are some letters left over that you could use, probably like articles, the, a, uh, an, and maybe conjunctions, and, and, or, and maybe some prepositions, to, from, over, beneath, things like that. I don't know. I was making that up. But chances are good the Braille system includes some sort of articles, some prepositions, and some conjunctions. Nonetheless, that was our second example of the multiplication rule. Let's try a third example. Oops. This one is by far the trickiest. Example three. Ordered sequences of nucleotides in messenger RNA define particular aminos. That is, strings of A's, G's, C's, or U's define these things called amino acids. Strings of A, G, C, or U define amino acids. Proteins are chosen from some 20 different amino acids. So there's 20 of these strings that consist of these letters and the uh, operation to all of life on this planet based on proteins is found from these strings of letters. Assuming any nucleotide can appear any number of times, that is, we don't care how many A's or G's or C's or U's there are in each sequence for an amino acid, and that all sequences are possible, that is, all combinations of A's and G's and U's and C's, what is the minimum number of nucleotide sequences such that all 20 amino acids can be uniquely encoded? So we want to figure out how many of these letters do we need to encode 20 amino acids? Okay, so here's what I'm going to suggest we do. We first note there are four nucleotides, that is A, G, C, and U, okay, we want some power R of four, that is, we could be like four for the four letters could go in the first position, four letters could go in the next position, four letters in the next position, and four letters. So how many times do we need to multiply four together? We need some power R of four. Such that four to the R is greater than or equal to 20. Because all we have to do is multiply together the number of ways we can fill in each nucleotide, and there are four ways we could do that. We want to figure out how many nucleotides are in the sequence such that we can encode all 20 amino acids. This problem isn't too difficult to um, just kind of brute force. You turn out to get R equal to 3. So in fact, we know 
that amino sequence, amino acids, should look like this. They are sequences of A's, G's, C's, and U's in three characters long, three nucleotides long. And so I'm going to offer to you this final remark. And indeed, check out a amino acid inverse RNA codon table. You will find in an inverse RNA codon table that all of the amino acids consist of exactly three nucleotides, but we have provided through some sort of like statistical theory the justification for why the amino acids needed to be three nucleotides long. Turns out to be pretty simple logic once you understand the base of the multiplication rule.